some packets up here. Yeah, we can that'd be great. Here. Yeah, I'm just kind of sharing. Yes. So, yeah. Perfect. Great. So here's a packet. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Here you guys can share that. We have a more. Okay. I think we should be good. Right. So my name's Rachel. If you didn't get that. Hi Rachel. Hi Rachel. Um. So I'm a first year intern here with Crew, and I actually graduated from Stevens Point in May with a degree in psychology. And I also got Myers in French and Religious Studies, because I have the credit, so why not? Um, fun fact, I've actually studied French for eight years, and I'm still not fluent. <laughs> like, here's my process, okay? Like, I hear something, and then my brain has to translate that from French to English. Listen, formulate a response, say that response, translate to French, speak that into French, and then they say something back. Um, and it's really hard. And I consistently find myself, like, you know, I'll simply speak in English, and then I'll use a French accent, and I'll just kind of, like, skate through class, and I'll think the professor doesn't call me. Um, <laughs> and even, like, the process of learning French pronunciation was awful. I had a professor, and I would be like, uh, and she'd be like, no, 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 uh, and I'm like, what did I say? I just said that. <laughs> See, Dr. Cook knows. And it is tiring. Um. But there was a time when that translation became easier for me. See, last summer I went on a summer mission with crew Paris, and during this time, I did not want to stand out like an American because I was there for six weeks. And so it blend in, I would like speak in French or really use my accent. Sometimes my French sounded like really good, like, wow, you look like you're from here. But around like 65% of the time, I was like, oh, my name is Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to. Like, I would attempt to slow down my English, and I would be like, Brooke, how are you? But if Brooke didn't speak English, no matter how slow I went down, or no matter how clearly I enunciated, she would just be lost, because it wasn't a lesson of hearing but comprehension. And this language barrier was really frustrating. I wanted to be heard. I had the words in English to say, but I just couldn't communicate it well. And then the person I was talking to would be like, I don't know what you're saying, I know you're getting frustrated, and I'm frustrated, whole cycle. <laughs> but the more I spoke French, and the more I heard French, I became better at French. Now, you might be thinking like, oh my gosh, I thought we were here to learn about the gospel, how the effect of this language play into it. But just like my experience with French and my experience going to Paris, it's same for how we tell the truth of Jesus to other people on our campus. See, we can, we can sit in a classroom setting, we can hear Daryl preach, we can he go to church and hear that, we can have quiet times, but all of that <coughs> is different from actually communicating it to another person. And only by going into immersive experience like this, or other places, and applying the basics will we become deeper comprehension instead of simply speaking louder or slower. And so, yeah. In similar ways, like I grew up in the church, and so growing up, I heard like all these great words like sanctification and fellowship and trinity, and I'm like, or grace, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so great, it makes sense. But if I go and share that with someone who's never had that experience, all of a sudden I'm using a completely different language, and the person will be lost because they don't understand the power and meaning behind the words, mm -hmm. and the point, it's just lost, and they don't get it. Just like when I tried to speak to French students in English. <laughs> and you see, like, sharing Jesus with people, it's something I'm really passionate about. Like, that's why I'm here, and I believe it's essential. All of you guys are going to go into different places in the world. Like, maybe that's in Wisconsin. Maybe that's somewhere else. Maybe you're, like, what I wanted to do, become a psychotherapist. Maybe you become a teacher. Maybe you do something else. Like, I don't know, chemistry with you. Um, but no matter what you're doing, you're bringing Jesus with you. And I want you to be equal equipped enough to do that, and I want you to become fluent enough in the gospel to where no matter your situation or who you're talking to, you're able to share the truth of what Jesus did on the cross. So some of you in this room, like, we're all coming from different places. You might be like, I grew up in the church. I don't know where I am right now. I have no idea who Jesus is. My friend just signed up to this retreat and now I'm here. That might be you. Um, or you're like, why do I need to tell others about Jesus? That doesn't make sense. Some of you might have been so impacted by your encounter with Jesus, you can't help but to tell others about him. 
but you don't know how. And some of you might be like, I don't know, I'm here, you only offer two seminars, and this one sounds cooler. Great. <laughs> <laughs> and you might be in the middle of any of those camps, but whatever camp you fall into, I just want to say welcome. Um, and if this is something, if Christianity, this whole thing is something you're like, just as absorbing, absorb. I would love for you to do that. But this teaching is geared more towards how do we share Jesus with others. But I still want you to feel welcome to listen, engage, and ask me questions later. I love a good question, and I love a good tangent. So, just fine. <laughs> or, ask your discussion group when you meet up with them, too. They also love questions, and they also love tangents. Well, they'll grow. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> last night, Daryl did an amazing job explaining, like, the truth of the gospel, what Jesus has done for us. And I'm like, dude, I got a seminar tomorrow. You just want to, like, come in and fill it? <laughs> um, and his, he was great. But if the, Jesus is the savior of our lives, meaning we trust Jesus is the only way to have a relationship with God, why would we not share him with others? If Jesus has truly impacted my life and saved me from not knowing God and not being able to do it, why would I want to keep him to myself? Why would I want what other people say to shame me? Why would I want to do that when the, I have brought nothing of worth to the table and it's all Jesus? And so my hope and prayer for everyone in this room is to fall deeply in love with Jesus and to let that truth of God fully, radically change and transform your life. And if you're scared about, like, oh, does this mean I have to go on campus and talk to strangers? Well, consider this your French immersive experience, where it's scary, and you might not know what word you're using, and you know that grammatical sentence was wrong, um, but ultimately you will learn more, you will grow, and you will graduate with a French minor. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I also don't want you guys to just have this great experience and be like, oh my gosh, like, I met Natalia, she's so great, I love her. And then you go back and be like, <laughs> and just avoid it. I want you guys to take this and apply it to your everyday lives. So one way I found to keep growing spiritually is to share with others. And one super helpful tool for that is this blue booklet that Dr. Cook mentioned earlier. So this is the booklet his sister shared with him in 1975. And you know we all see where he is now. So I like this tool a lot. I think it's concise. I think it's clear. And I think it's really just a great launch pad for deeper conversations. But I mean, kind of look at it. it just kind of looks 80s. And the 80s are great. And even like hearing Dr. Cook, it might have been the 70s. Like, that's great. They weren't bad times. But we also, our culture has shifted. The dynamic has changed. Like, less people are growing up in the church and more people are growing up unchurched with a false view of what Christianity means and what Jesus truly did. We are becoming more biblically illiterate. And so when we go to people and we engage and we say, you can have a fellowship with God, what does that mean? So I value this tool, and I value talking about Jesus. That's why I'm here in front of you. So what this staff team did was we created a tool to help translate some of the verbiage in this blue booklet to make it more engageable with our current culture. And that's what the package. Great connections. So we're going to go through this. And we're going to go through the blue booklet, the KGP, knowing God personally, at the same time. And we're going to just kind of like dive in together. So on the packet, it starts off with like, it's color coded, and that makes my heart really happy. Um, <laughs> first of all, so the green in the packet, those are context clues for whoever wants to share the gospel with someone else. So let's say Carla goes home and she wants to go share with her sister or her sister, I don't know. Jane. Oh. That doesn't exist. Carla can use these green contacts clues to help her know more, but she doesn't necessarily have to vocalize every single thing. Whereas like the blue in the packet, those are really helpful questions to help you engage and share with that person you're talking to. And then black is what the actual booklet says. Great. Yeah, cool. yeah so we're gonna start in point one. So it says God loves you and created you to know him personally, and he has a wonderful plan for your life. That's true. That's great. And it also sounds a little creepy. So, like, we want to say this, but we also want to emphasize the point that God created us 
to be in relationship with him. God wants us to know him. So how do we know God wants us like that? That would be the next Bible verse, right below it in the booklet. So the, this John 3.16 verse is, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Love this verse. It shows that God loves us so much, he did that great sacrifice, and that he wants us to be in relationship with him. So, in this point, it's like, okay, I grew up in the church, so when I think of eternal life, I think of heaven. Does everyone think that? Do people think it differently? So I want to know what the person thinks. Always. I'm a psych major. So what, this is a great place to say, like, what do you think eternal life is? So when Carla and Jane are talking, Carla's going to ask Jane, Carla, Jane, what do you think eternal life means? Like, what is that to you? And then Jane can be like, oh, I think it's... Whatever she would say. I don't know. Um, And Carla would be like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think eternal life is this next verse in this booklet. Like, now this is eternal life, that they may know you. But only through God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. We just celebrate that that is our relationship. And if we have that relationship with God, that's where we're going. To know God and be able to share that. And this is like fun, but it's also like up here of like very philosophical, and so a way of bringing that down is to share like this fun friend analogy. I love friends. Um, and like when you make a friend, you don't instantly know them. You don't instantly know their whole life story. You don't know what makes them tick and what really frustrates them. You grow that over time. You grow in intimacy together. And as you learn more about each other, then you know more about each other. What makes you tick and how you know that after I this night. Sorry. <laughs> and that's the same that what God wants of, for us. And so the question on the bottom of the booklet on the right hand side page is what prevents us from knowing God personally? Which is like good. But another way we could say this is for yourself what gets in the way of knowing God like this? What stops you from encountering God like this close friend developing over time? So let, let that think. And I want you guys to think about this for yourself, too. Like, what does prevent you personally from knowing God? Like this. And that would be point two in the booklet, which is our condition. People are simple and separated from God, so we cannot know him personally or experience his love <coughs> for our lives. So green contacts for you. Like, sin is a churchy word. If people grew up in the church and they got really hurt by their church, their connotation with sin can be much different than what Daryl was talking about. Of the law shows us how far we've fallen from God. And so we want people to help understand that, and we want them to understand that. So instead of saying, like, oh, people are sinful, say something like, God created us to thrive in relationship with him. We wanted to be in that connection, but something happened. We responded to his love with distrust. We chose to find life through other things like academics, approval, our boyfriends, girlfriends, etc. And because of those choices, it separates us from him and affects our relationship with him. All of humanity does this. We see the brokenness everywhere. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3. So now this is the question. We're going to have a little dialogue here because we're all Christian, and that's okay to do, and it's not scary. So how do you see brokenness in the world, culture, other people, etc.? <coughs> Please answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think a good example uh, is like sports. You know, there's a lot of breaking the rules and just you know fighting that goes on. Um, you know, something that's so cool competitively uh, can turn into just like brawls and um, hatred, you know, for the other team pretty quickly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure. Two more people? Um, well, I mean, there's been some incidences on campus, but mm-hmm. I'm sure it happens all over um, on different campuses. But just um, when it comes to like 
racial slurs or um, when it comes to like uh, discriminating people for like who they are, like their race, and even those with mental health mm -hmm. or like disabilities, and like judging um, those people who um, that's part of who they are and mm -hmm. um, putting them down for that. Yeah, for sure. God did not design that. Like, he doesn't. Or he designed the race, but he didn't yeah. Sorry, thank you for clarifying that because I meant that and didn't articulate no, that. So I really appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> One more person. How do you see brokenness in the world? Yeah. Through like school shootings mm -hmm. and like all that stuff. Yeah. So I'm sure each one of you has a different thought in your head. Maybe it was similar to those shared and maybe it was like completely different. And you can answer this question in a hundred ways. And I could probably have spilled my time saying, like, oh, this, 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 and this, but that's not it. And the point is there's so many different answers because the brokenness is all around us. And it doesn't leave one person unscathed. And we are not immune to this brokenness either. We were created to have a relationship with God, but because of our stubborn self-will, so I know I'm really stubborn. I don't know about you, but I will fight tooth and nail. If I think something is right, get out of my way. And because of that, and because of that, I choose to go my own independent way away from God and I separate my connection to him. And it's broken. And this is through active rebellion, which I always use the example of intentionally turning the wrong way on the one way street I live on. <laughs> or, <laughs> or passive indifference and then I always use the example of when I go on the highway to go home and I'm 10 miles over the speed limit do I say oh my gosh this is wrong I should stop this or am I like everyone's speeding it's fine I got places to live 10 over the limit that's fine <laughs> but all of those are evidence of what the Bible calls sin because I'm choosing my way over the way so the next question, how do you see brokenness and sin in your life? On the surface, this might just seem like a simple question. It might just be like, oh, duh, of course they thought that. Like, I know there are times I go up to people and I'm like, oh, here you go. And they're just like, I'm like, oh, I don't need to ask them that question. It's too simple. But it is the most important question you can ask someone. Because if you don't acknowledge your need of brokenness and you don't acknowledge that reality, you do not need a savior. Mm. See, like it says in this context, it's God's requirement to get into heaven is perfection. Nobody's perfect, so somehow we all need to find forgiveness in God's eyes. And after you've asked this question and after they've answered, humanly speaking, there's no way to work back to perfection. Because in the words of Hannah Montana, nobody's perfect. <laughs> and so then the next part is like this Bible verse and then that diagram all that's written there is great um, and the diagram really represents how God is holy and we can't work our way to join him and so a question to ask people and yourselves is how do you try and fix your brokenness on your own how do you try and earn God's love instead of so for me, I like performing. I like doing things for people. I like not sharing how much I need someone. Mm -hmm. If I cannot solve the problem, or res and then mm -hmm. when I can't solve this problem that comes up, or I can't resolve it on my own, I feel like a failure, and then I wallow in that failure. And I begin to let that failure define me. Or I begin looking for other people's approval, and like feel like I may lose a friend or my friend's love. I became anxious, because what does that say about my work? By myself, I will continually fail to see any good come from how well I do and what people see of me. I can never become perfect by using those avenues. So we need help. I need help. We can't do it on our own. And because God loves us, he responded. He responded by sending Jesus to die in our place. He lived the life no one could live and died the cross everyone deserved so that we can do this. So why did Jesus have to die on the cross? People might not have thought of that before. And
and that really irks people's view and role of Jesus. And then if you want the answer, it's in the next like five words of the Bible verse in the booklet, which is Christ died for our sins. That's why he died. And that diagram, it's on like the orange page of the blue booklet. I haven't really been reading the wrong that, I'm sorry. But it shows the same dilemma as in the point two, but now it's God sent an arrow down to us. And Jesus bridges that gap so we are able to know God personally. All because of Jesus. But it's not enough to just know these truths. Like, God made the first move and it elicits a response from us. And when I say that, God made the first move and elicits a response from us, I see a completely different turn in the person's eyes I'm sharing with. Instead of just saying, it's not enough to just know these truths. Because it shows how needed our response is. Ellie, can you make that black? Otherwise, I'm going to hold Daryl and you're never going to do the next seminar. Okay. No, that's okay. Well, well, we'll figure it out. So, going into the next response. We must individually receive Christ, and then we can know God personally and experience his love for us. And so I really like this verse in John 1. He gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe. So what does it mean to receive something from someone? This is what I want you to answer right now. So, so can two people answer that for me? What does it mean to receive something from someone? I mean, we have to accept what you've received. Mm-hmm. You're so right, Zephy. Thank you. So, like, there's an action on our part, and on God's part. And if you look at this verse in John 1.12, you see the four verbs of receive, believe, gave, and become. So we have to actively believe that Jesus died for our sins and received his sacrifice on the cross. Mm-hmm. And, God gave. and God gave this to us so that we can become his children. So, the next verse is Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a work by God, not so that no one can boast. So, this is another discussion question, at least one person, two at most. What do you think this Ephesians verse is saying? And how would you define it? in classroom. You don't get shame if you say, well, I just want to talk to God. I would love to, Ellie. So, looking at the Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 verse, um, what do you think the verse is saying? Because as Kevin just showed, like, he understood the first three points we just went through. He understood, like, why Jesus had to die. He understood he didn't have to do it. And he understood, like, he did deserve it. But God gave it to him. Yep. So then we go into the receiving Christ by personal invitation. On It's like right about the two circles in the KGP. And it has a paragraph which says receiving Christ involves turning to God from self-repentance and trusting Christ to come into our lives and forgive us of our sins and to make us what he wants us to be. So just to agree intellectually that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for our sins is not enough, nor is it enough to have a super-emotional experience. We receive Christ by faith as an act of will. So, and then it goes into, like, these two circles. Fun fact, when I first went through the KGP, I thought they were H's and was really confused. They're thrones, Fine. So, what would you say is the main difference between the circle on the left and the circle on the right? Yeah. Can you let them think about it? Just like I did. In that slightly awkward pause, embrace those while you share with people. 
And so like the answer to this is where the cross is. So on the left circle, you see this cross is outside the person's life, and their self is on the throne. Whereas on the right circle, you see the cross is in the life. And just as Daryl said today, like it's not that all of a sudden the self and what you want is thrown out of your life, but it's that it's restored to its proper purpose through the idea of the net. So then the next part, so let's say they're like, oh my gosh, I've never heard this before. What do I do? This is amazing. And they're like, great, oh my gosh, this is um, You're going to flip the page and like show them a prayer, kind of like the prayer Daryl led in last night. And a really important question to ask after this is, what is the main thing that this prayer is saying? What do you hear this prayer say? And yes, like, this is a third opportunity for people to verbalize the message of the gospel and to answer what they think they have heard you saying. And it's also a great time to be like, oh, actually, like, we should go back a little bit because I messed up here and we should, like, talk about this more. I've done that before. So that is the gospel. And that is like the tool of knowing that personally, which I think is super helpful. I think it's super helpful to articulate it. I think it's like the truth inside of it is eternal. Like what Jesus did for us isn't going to change, whether we use words of like modern words and a bunch of slang, or whether we use like King James version. Like the gospel remains the same. <coughs> and I want to challenge you guys to think about like what this means for your lives. Like, what does it mean to you personally, and what does it mean to the people around you? See, the implications, like, radically shift everything from constantly searching, yearning, and performing. And I don't know what my life would look like if I didn't have Jesus. So, that is it. And I want you guys to be confident and empowered to go back to campus to share this with other people. I don't want you guys to simply know it and have it. I want you to feel empowered. So, that's it. So, find me if you have questions, ask me later. Thanks.